guys, thank you so much for joining me in another video. So as you can tell based on the title, well today we are talking about a recent article from the New York Times. So it's been a decade since Phoebe Philo has given a formal interview. She's a very private person. She famously said the chicest thing is to not be on Google. But recently she decided to talk to Vanessa Friedman of the New York Times. It's funny, we were just talking about Vanessa Friedman not too long ago. But I thought in today's video, instead of just rehashing everything she stated in the this article and just reading it, I'm not gonna do that. I thought we'd split it up into two categories. We talk about the initial release of this collection and sort of the discussion around that, as well as what she plans on doing in the future. In this interview, she really didn't speak that much about the brand themes or stories, which is kind of my first point I actually want to talk about. When it comes to explaining her work, she stated this, I don't feel there's a huge amount of storytelling that needs to be done, Miss Philo 50 said. The subject was Miss Philo's reluctance to talk about her work, her plans, her Self. I'm not particularly into that, she went on. I don't feel myself that I need a lot of that from other fashion houses. I feel that it's just not necessary. To a certain extent, you either like it or you don't. Someone telling me a story isn't going to make me like it more. It's a coat, it's a pair of trousers. I do appreciate a level of straightforwardness. Now, personally, myself, I actually like it when brands talk about their history, their inspiration, or things like their processes. I actually really love that. But I do think what she's actually getting at here is the over-intellectualization of fashion as being sort of a cop-out for very uninspiring clothing. I'm personally not gonna name any specific brands. I love how Phoebe Philo's clothing has always been able to stand on its own, and maybe you could argue that's a criticism. But to that I also say, I actually think a lot of this collection was very highly referential to what was at Old Celine. Be it the furry shoes, the bags, the zipper pants, the funnel neck coats, the scarf tops, the jackets. To me, so much of this was actually her universe, but it didn't necessarily need like an explanation. There was so much of old Celine in this new release. There is like a major straightforwardness about this collection, but I will say a lot of these pieces actually take me back to, I would say Phoebe Philo's own world, her own universe. And maybe it's not as obvious or centered around certain themes as other brands, but this was definitely her world. These were her styles. These were her signatures and it was very welcomed by I think a lot of old Celine customers. So the next thing that they talked about was the expectation. There may have been an expectation that I could have provided everything to everyone immediately, she finally said, and that's just not possible. It takes time and effort to make most things that have meaning. One has to stand for something. I think a lot of people were expecting this to be on the same level as old Celine, which I think was kind of naive to sort of ask for. Celine, which is this legacy house with decades of history and different creative directors. She's truly building this from the ground up. It was truly like a lookbook on a website released in very small batches. And we'll talk a little bit later as to why I think she went into that direction. As much as I would love for her to have the same presence as Celine, it's not realistic from like a business perspective. And I think she's gonna have to take her time with expanding. And again, as she states, she can't be everything to everyone immediately. And I don't think she should be everything to everyone. She needs to go at her own pace. Would it have been greater to see a big rollout, to see stores opening, and to see a major fashion show and to have like a front row with celebrities. But I'm gonna be honest, I don't think she's gonna do that with her brand. I actually think she's looking to change a lot of the, uh, I guess, frustrations that she would have as a designer on the runway. And we'll talk about some of the things she does plan on expanding this year. Another major theme that was discussed in this interview was just how she's choosing to release her work as edits over seasons. So Miss Philo views her work as one continuous collection and does not believe in seasons, which is why she prefers the word edit and divides those edits into, quote, deliveries. Delivery of edit two is now on sale and delivery two is planned to rise at the end of March. So apparently March 26th, hopefully I can get this video out in time. But a lot of what she has already dropped for the second edit, we either saw images of what she has dropped with the first edit. What had happened was with the release of this collection was she had her lookbook. So you can see on the images tab, all the images. So we're seeing the release of a lot of those 
pieces that we didn't see with the first drop or we are seeing new pieces in a new color size or pattern and we still have yet to see a lot of what came in that lookbook from the consumer perspective i really appreciate this this is and more in line with a slower fashion pace. The idea is to have this lookbook, these looks slowly get released over the span of a year, which is truly the opposite of what we are seeing most of these major LVMH brands doing. Many of these brands will release 10 collections a year, men's, women's version, spring, summer, fall, winter, pre-fall, resort, whereas she has one major collection and it's a slow gradual drip where the customer can take in everything and can also know what to anticipate. It will be interesting to see come September or October, does she release more images? Does she release like a new lookbook or is it just a continuation of what we're seeing? But it is not the traditional way at which we are seeing fashion released and while as a consumer it's great to see a new collection almost every other month at this point right I do think there is a burnout that is happening with these designers I think we are slowly seeing a lot of these designers shut down their own houses be it to keep up with this ridiculous pace of fashion like I was really saddened when I heard about the news of Dries Van Noten we just see other big designers kind of just like step down from these labels it's actually quite sad to see and I do think there's a lot of expectations from a lot of these big houses. I don't know what went down at Celine. I think there was this expectation for her to grow and grow and grow and to expand in all these different categories. Like you see all of the different categories Celine has now ventured into since she's left and it's a totally different brand. For her, she's saying instead of releasing 10 collections in 10 different categories and to release perfume and candles and makeup and all of these things, this is her saying, no, I'm just gonna do one thing, do one thing really well know what my customer wants and respond to it. Another thing that Phoebe Philo experienced as a designer was her work was heavily copied by so many others. There's a reason why she's choosing to release her collections at the very end of fashion month. And she also stated this, I don't know why there has to be such a beginning and an end in our industry. I don't know why it can't just be continuous. And then Vanessa Friedman writes, well, maybe because planned obsolescence is what drives a fashion business in today, out tomorrow and all that. And then she says, I still don't believe it needs to be like that. I continue to wear clothes today that I've had for 20 years. One of my favorite pairs of trousers is a pair of Chloe trousers I made. They're important to me. These pieces, I don't wanna get rid of them. So what we have now is a body of work over a year and it's all connected. And again, I just think this is such a different way to look at fashion. And while I'm sure there's some people that are going to critique Phoebe Philo for not having a collection every two months, the like size and scale and what she wants to do, I actually think it is totally appropriate. And I totally respect Phoebe Philo's decision to have a slower release of her line of her brand. So now let's switch to things that we can look forward to, things that she discussed about what Phoebe Philo's brand will do in 2024 or soon, hopefully. Now, one thing that the article did talk about was price, and this from the article, as the collections get fuller, there will be a greater range of prices, some with jersey pieces that are relatively, in brackets here, more affordable, although she isn't apologizing for the prices. An unpopular opinion, I don't think she should apologize for the prices. But if you were in any capacity familiar with old Celine prices, as well as other brands, on this level. Yes, it's expensive. Personally, I would never buy that $8,000 bag, but could I fathom spending $3,500? Yes. Would I spend five figures on a coat? No, but $4,000? Yes, maybe. And maybe because I had already like mentally prepared myself based on the fact that I was reading up on this release. When we saw like, news articles up to the release of this collection, it was stated that she was going to want to make an appeal to the old Celine customer. Is Kendall Jenner's $8,000 coat or 20 something thousand dollar Fur coat absurd yes is her $4,800 Kit Cabas bag really expensive yes nobody is arguing that but I'm sure you could comb through the Tom Ford website or Brunello Cuccinelli any of these brands that are started by individuals by the way and you could absolutely find products at ridiculous prices but nobody's actually doing that right because it's expected from these designers Tom Ford decided to create his own brand that was Price like it was Gucci. And Phoebe Philo, yes, yeah, she's positioning her brand like it's Old Celine. And Old Celine was very expensive. I remember when Pharrell famously wore the $67,000 Celine coat in 2015. 
that's not even post pandemic prices that's 2015 prices that is ridiculous but yeah celine priced their products out kind of outrageous prices and i think the argument is that like it's not democratized fashion you know not everyone can afford it a lot of people are criticizing that about the phoebe philo launch and to that i say we are already seeing a lot of the dupes of Phoebe Philo. Even just this past fashion month, there's a dupe at every price point for what she is offering. And it's so funny, when I did my initial review, looking at the Phoebe Philo second edit, a lot of you guys were commenting these similarities that you saw this past fashion month. But I will say it will be interesting to see what comes of this jersey line. I think about how the row, they have their scuba line, which is still very expensive. It's not in like the five figure territory you're not going to see five figure coats it's in the upper hundreds to lower thousands maybe phoebe philo will do something like that with this who knows at the end of the day the Celine customer, I'm sure there were some like residual customers that came from the Michael Kors era. I think a lot of people that were buying Celine were buying Celine because of Phoebe Philo. They weren't like, oh my gosh, the legacy of Celine Vipiana really speaks to me. I don't know, maybe, but I don't think it was that at all. There's Phoebe Philo and then there's Cause. There's no shame in that. Like I bought myself a Cause bag last year to see what all the fuss was about. And again, another critique was that, well, you could buy a Peter Doe, right? But Peter Doe is still quite high. Peter Doe is not cause. It's still quite expensive, but like nobody's upset about Peter Doe pricing his brand at undemocratized prices because I think there is an understanding that when you're an emerging brand, the clothing is going to be higher. And again, no one's like upset about Tom Ford pricing. And I think it's fair for Phoebe Philo to want to be on that level, for her to want to be at a Tom Ford or even a Brunello Cuccinelli. It makes me wonder why is it that she is not able to create a product at the level of Tom Ford and aspire to price her brand at a similar price point, but he can, like what? what is it? So the topic of stores came up and this was stated during COVID, which coincided with her planning, shopping habits had changed in a way that she saw as working to her advantage because it meant she could start without a store. But she doesn't intend to keep it that way. By summer, she hopes to open some sort of physical space, maybe temporary, maybe not, first in New York and then London. Personally, I am so excited about this. I have been looking for a reason to go to New York. Like there's always a reason to go to New York. I was kind of hoping that there would be some kind of like upon the release of the launch that we would get word of like a launch being released in New York or somewhere like that. Toronto's really not that far of a flight away. Whenever that happens, I will definitely be there. Definitely better than having to go through a package forwarding service. But yes, but back to the point of her saying she can't do everything for everyone all at once. We just gotta give her time. With this first initial release, she really wanted to get a pulse on who and where her customer is and take action according to that. This was like kind of the most exciting news for me personally. And I think it'll just be nice to like touch and feel and get a sense of these products in person. And then finally, the topic of fashion shows came up. So this from the article, there may even be a fashion show in time, but right now she said, quote, in today's world where there's so much fashion and so much big fashion, I try to remember that most of the big houses started with one human being who had an idea about what they wanted to do. I think we are truly just at like the tip of the iceberg with Phoebe Philo. This initial drop was her seeing what the market was, seeing what she could do. And I think with these first two edits, this was Phoebe Philo just really testing the waters, getting a pulse on what the consumer marketplace is today. Five, six years ago, fashion was very different. Like so much has happened, but I think the whole premise of building a wardrobe and having those forever pieces, but also allowing yourself to have those eccentric pieces. I stated this in my past video, Phoebe Philo is not just about like basics, but it is sort of this instinctual primal, almost like even animalistic way of dressing. And that sounds really, like really weird to say, but it kind of is like, about doing things in a more like instinctual way. And even if something is weird and strange and even not conventionally sexy, but can still make you feel sexy. And just as a bonus point, I did find it very curious how they did talk a little bit about menswear. I don't think she's doing menswear yet, or I don't even know, maybe she never does menswear. But I did find it interesting how they did bring up Edward Einenfell and 
and how she made him a suit and how he had always wanted her to make menswear. When you look at her historically, men have worn her work, be it like Pharrell to Kanye West. You know, many men have worn her work. Again, we can't expect everything all at once, but I do think there is a unisex quality to a lot of her work. And at the end of the day, men and women can wear whatever they want, right? So that was pretty much the article. It wasn't really major controversial or anything like that. It was just great to hear from her. This is how she wants to move forward with her brand. But back to this point about storytelling, her saying that she doesn't want to have to tell a story, her clothes should be able to speak for themselves. I've actually always felt when you look at her collections, you actually see a woman at different periods in her life. Her fashion has always been more autobiographical at different stages, be it her period at Chloe to her period at Celine, her in her 30s, her in her 40s, her in her 50s, these different stages she's in. Does she necessarily wear everything? No, but I think she looks at the woman in her life and can see them wearing this or can see like another way of dressing for women at this period. That's probably why it didn't resonate with like people on TikTok. May not be for Gen Z, but like everything is for Gen Z now. But I will tell you right now, there's a lot of women that are so thankful Phoebe at Philo is back. It was almost like this fantasy of wanting to see women portrayed in this way that we don't quite see women portrayed as. If we do see women, it's kind of this more glamorous, oh, look at former supermodel who has aged gracefully, right? We never see the story of a woman and her pregnancy scars or her very visible wrinkles, the very obvious imperfections that we see as women. Yet I think with this collection, Phoebe Philo's fantasy has always been to see women portrayed in this kind of way, in the way that feels more raw, intuitive, primal, almost animal Animalistic in a way. That's what we are seeing with this collection. That is Phoebe Philo's fantasy. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining me in another video and I hope to see you in the next one.